Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to Boston College and to what I hope will be a very informative evening talk by uh, Professor Tanya Raksham uh, on the subject of the anatomy of religious cleansing, non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire, 1914 to 1918, which we foresee as the first of a series of lectures on the positions of Christians in the Middle East and their situation. This is being sponsored by Boston College, by the Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literatures, Department of Political Science, by the Islamic Civilization and Societies Program, and the School of Theology and Ministry, and in fact, we are in the STM library right now. Uh, a great moving force behind this has been Christian Solidarity International, and I'm very grateful to them for putting together the entire concept and for facilitating all of this, and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. So let me introduce John Eibner from Christian Solidarity International. This series of events was conceived in 2011 as the high hopes placed in the Arab Spring uh, were giving way to another grisly reality, and that is to say, widespread religious cleansing, especially of Christians, Alawites, Yazidis, and Shiites. Tragically, this phenomenon is currently at an advanced stage in Syria and in Iraq, and it shows no sign of diminishing. The Christians and other religious minorities are in the midst of a violent existential crisis, and survival is far from assured. But it is fitting this evening that our series begins with an examination of the anatomy of religious cleansing, non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire, 1914 through 1918. The genocide of Armenians and uh, Assyrian Christians in Turkey 100 years ago marked the first great genocide of the modern age. Somewhat like the current wave of religious cleansing in the Middle East, the genocide in Turkey was preceded by what I call the Ottoman Spring which promised freedom and equality for all and was celebrated by members of uh, Turkey's religious, uh, all of Turkey's religious and ethnic communities. And many of today's victims of religious cleansing in, in uh, Syria and Iraq are indeed descendants of survivors of the great genocide in Turkey. I know of no one more eminently qualified to speak on that genocide than Professor Taner Akcam. His most recent book, the widely acclaimed The Young Turks, Crime Against Humanity, The Armeni Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing uh, in the Ottoman Empire, is based largely on pioneering research undertaken in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul. Taner Akcam is currently professor of history at Clark University and holds the Aram Kuluzdian and Mugar Chair in Armenian Studies. Let us give a warm welcome to Professor Akshay. So Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, John, for this nice introduction. Uh, today I'm here to speak about uh, Ottoman genocide against Christian between 1914 to 1918. Let me begin with an observation. The last century of Ottoman Empire especially the period between 1878 and 1924, was characterized by a serial of forced mass deportations, expulsions, and ethnic cleansing, which included mass killings. The Armenian genocide might represent the pinnacle of this period. However, the ethnic cleansing of Greeks, 1913-1914, genocide against Assyrians during the First World War years, and genocide against Pontic Greeks. This is the Pontic Greeks, the Greeks that were living, especially here in that area. So this is the Greeks. In that area was called Pontic Greek, and they were target of genocidal massacres 1921-22. So uh, the Greeks 1921-22, are as important as the Armenian genocide. They occurred as a part of the same process. I think it's fair uh, for us to use the term Ottoman genocide and talk about a genocidal process to describe the period 1878 to 1924. As you may notice, I made a distinction between genocidal process 
and moments of genocides. These are two different categories. One covers the long-term process, 1878 to 1924. The other is certain moment that genocide occurred, like Armenians, 1915-17, and the Assyrians during the same period, and the Pontus Greeks, 1921-22, and of course, ethnic cleansing towards Greeks again during the First World War years. All of these mass deportations and massacres and genocides were carried out by one state. They represented the policy of the Ottoman administration, and each event was interrelated with the other. Despite this, despite this fact, until recently, with some exceptions to the contrary, all of these events have been analyzed and discussed as separate social phenomena without much contextualization. Each ethnic group, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, and all others, developed a histori historiography confined to its own history and never in connection with other mass crimes of the same era and region. There have been some limited attempts in recent years to explain the entire process within the broader context of Ottoman demographic policy, but for the most part, scholars working in this area stayed within their own niche field of inquiry. To formulate this in another way, even in cases where there were attempts to contextualize or pull the different cases together, this has been done for the most part by placing these different events next to each other and separate as separate entities and what we call in our field comparative perspective. So one compared one event with the other. So rather than trying to explain them as evidence of one interconnected process or a one history. This is what has to be done, and this is maybe what I'm trying to do this evening. My suggestion today is that we develop a new understanding of the period and start talking about Ottoman genocide of Christians. I will present today a short glimpse of the period of 1913-18 and show how the policies against Greeks, Assyrians, and Armenians are strongly interrelated. They were not isolated acts, but a part of comprehensive policy implemented by one government. They were carried out as a part of a general plan, which could be called demographic policy, or ethnic cleansing of Anatolia, or what I call occasionally homogenization of Anatolia on Turkish Muslim ground. And it was the policy of expulsion of basically all or most of the Christian population of Anatolia. The policy was implemented as a general resettlement plan between 1913 and 18, and continued against the Pontic Greeks in the years of 1921-22, and finalized with, maybe you have heard, the first population exchange agreement between Greece and Turkey in 1924. This was the final touch of this process. The main goal of this policy was to ensure the formation of a homogeneous Anatolia, an Anatolia with a majority Turkish Muslim population. The elimination of the Christian population was central to this plan, but it was not the only component. The plan, this demographic plan for that period, had two primary components. One was focused towards the Muslim population of non-Turkish origin, such as Kurds, Arabs, and the migrants from Balkan. They were relocated and dispersed during that period among the Turkish majority for the purpose of ensuring assimilation among the Turkish population. The other component was the elimination of non-Muslim people from Anatolia, the result of which upward of two million Armenians, Assyrians and Greeks were either forcibly expelled or massacred between 1914 and 18. For the period of 1914-18, which I'm going to summarize for you this evening, this policy resulted 
in a complete reconfiguration of Anatolia. An ethnic makeup of Anatolia changed totally. The estimated 17 million people who lived in Anatolia at the time were so uprooted that by the end of this period, at least one third of this population had either been resettled somewhere else, deported, or annihilated. Shortly, expulsion, extermination, and assimilation were three important component of this policy. So I am going to make eight point, eight characteristic of this policy to make it clear for you. And it covers all Christian groups, no exception among them. And when it is, then I will tell what are these differences. Ava number one, this is the eight point and point one. Available Ottoman documents show that this plan began to be implemented first in the Aegean region against the Greeks in 1913 and followed spring of 1914. <coughs> Basically, the Greeks in the Aegean coast was the target of this policy. And during the war years, this policy was expanded to include the Assyrians, Chaldeans, and Nestorians, and especially the Armenians, and eventually reached a level that can only be described as genocidal. The Ottoman losses incurred during Balkan War of 1912 were a major triggering point for this plan. 1912 really was a serious turning plan point because Ottoman lost 83 of their percent of their land holding in Europe and 69% of their population in Europe. So the entire European land holding was lost and even within one week. This was a big shock for Ottoman rulers. And not only they lost the land, they lost their homeland. So the enti almost entire ruling elite of the party, Union and Progress Party, they were not from Anatolia. They were actually from Macedonia and from Albania, from Balkan, and they lost their homelands. This was the big shock for them. And they agreed, as a result of this war, they agreed to exchange population with Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia. Indeed, first international known uh, population exchange agreement was signed between Serbia, Greece, and Bulgaria in 1913. Basically, on the border areas, the population were exchanged based on these agreements. And in their own words, then they extended this policy towards the Greeks in Western Anatolia. And this is how the Turkish authorities described their policy. Quote, in their own words, the policy against the Greeks aimed for liquidating the concentration of non-Turkish population that had accumulated at strategic points and which were susceptible to negative foreign influences. So there was a security concept attached to that idea. And for them, the Greeks in Western cost was the first biggest danger, security threat. So the first measures against the Greeks on the Aegean coast followed a two-track communication and operational system. On the surface, government had official population exchange agreement with Greece, according to which Muslims and Christians would be exchanged and resettled in their respective villages. So you have to keep in mind there were two different population exchange agreements between Greece and Turkey. Number one was just after the Balkan War, 1913, around November. And the second agreement was signed 1914, May. And then during that period, especially when they were negotiating with Greeks about the population exchange, they also implemented the forcible expulsion policy. So the two-track mechanism was following. 
On the one side, it was a legal act. Two states were sitting, negotiating, and making some agreement on population exchanges. And on the other hand, Ottoman authorities, almost towards the middle of 1913, established a special organization within the Turkish Defense Ministry. It was a governmental institution. And this special organization, this is like the Nazis SS later, you will hear, you will learn this also. This special organization carried out illegal operations which would include forcibly emptying Greek villages by the way of attacks on village and villages massacre and plunder. So during that time when they negotiating on the legal level with Greek government to exchange the population, at the same time, there was the secret operations, the special organizations unit were attacking Greek villages and the overall purpose was not extermination. There were massacres occasionally here and there. For example, Pocha, a small town, close to Smyrna, they exterminated around 200 Greek villagers because they didn't want to go to the shores and they were all pushed by the special organizations unit and the official policy was, oh, they escaped. It has nothing to do with the government policy. And the government then really uh, hired special uh, trade ships and these ships were taking these paid by Ottoman government and they were taking these refugees to Greece. So two-track mechanism which was used 1914 and the concrete preparations for this plan really started 1913 and continued uh, throughout 1914. <coughs> the policies that were set in motion against the Greeks between 1913 and 14 were forerunner of the subsequent wartime deportation against the Armenians and Assyrian population. We can easily say that the policies against the Greeks between 1913-14 were a trial run for Armenian Assyrian deportations and killing of 1915-17. Here the interesting part. The expulsion, the forcible expulsion of Greek population from that area stopped like a very sharp way. First, November 1914, with the beginning of First World War. The reason was Germany. It shows also when sometimes great powers pressures, they can stop certain policies. And during that period, Germany was negotiating with Greece for a possible participation of Greece in the war along with Germany, and Germany pressured Ottoman government in Istanbul. And we have the documents I published in the book. Uh, the o Ottoman interior minister sent a telegram circular to all provinces saying that stop forcibly removing Greeks from their villages based on our new policy. Our new policy is we have an agreement with Germany, we should not touch the Greek population. And indeed, they didn't touch Greek population during the first war years until 1917-18. It changed because of the Russian invasion from that part. And then 1917, they started, I will talk about it, to remove the Greek population from the coastal areas basically inside Anatolia, inside. not to Greece. They covered up this as military measures. So uh, it is interesting, the American ambassador to Istanbul, Henry Morgenthau, drew attention to the fact that the methods using during the Armenian genocide were similar to those used throughout the Greek expulsion. In a report to Washington, he wrote, quote, the Turks employed the same methods against both Greeks and Armenians. They took them into the Ottoman army, then transferred them to labor battalions, where thousands of Greeks died from cold, hunger, and other deprivations, just like the Armenians. 
the Greeks everywhere were organized into groups, then under the promises protection of the Turkish gendarme, were generally transported by foot to the inner regions of Anatolia." <coughs> End quote. When Morgenthau, what Morgenthau could not know, of course, was that in 1921-22, this time a new government, the nationalists in Ankara under leadership of Mustafa Kemal used exactly the same methods against the Pontuk Greeks. Arrest of the community leaders, where they were put on trial and hanged. Then separation of the able-bodied men who were soon killed or put in labor battalions. And then putting the third phase was putting the women and children on death marches. Exact the same pattern as they did with Greeks 1913-14 and then with Armenian 1915-17. It was like a following a certain playbook with all steps laid out. Point two, the deportations and resettlements of the entire Anatolian population during that period, 1913-18, was not only the result of preconceived, comprehensive plan, based on Ottoman archival materials, we can discern four different causes that were driven it, driving it. First one has a two phases, A and B. First, A, the Christians of Anatolia were perceived as existential threats to the nation, so forced deportation and extermination was taken as a main tactic of choice. With the Greeks, this took the form of forced deportation to Greece, accompanied by small-scale massacres and plunders, while the Armenians and Assyrians were more often subjected to mass extermination. B, new resettlement policy was developed, and the areas vacated by Christians were filled with Muslim immigrants who had come from Balkan and Caucasus. Two, Deportations for military reasons. So the deportation of some Nestorians from that area, one area, 1914 December, to the inside of Anatolia. And deportation of Armenians before genocide started, 1915 March, from this area inside of Anatolia. And deportation of Armenians, again, from Cilicia, what is called Marash, from approximately this area again inside of Anatolia. They were all covered up as military operations. And they were, for example, in Armenian case, they heard there was a plan of British landing here. They thought Armenians would be a dangerous element to cooperate with Armenians, and they were removed inside of Anatolia. So there, uh, this is the deportation for military reasons, second. Third one is a deportation for political reason. Of course, it's very difficult to make this distinction between military and political reasons, but it's, it makes the picture very clearer for us. Deportation for political reason, I mean, for example, the Arab tribes in Syria and some Kurdish tribes. They were deported from Syria inside Anatolia, for example, some families all the way to Bursa, to that area. And they picked up special Arab families, influential Arab <laughs> families in Syria, for example. They thought they could create some political problem for their uh, conducting the war and other reasons. And at the same time, they also deported a group of Jewish uh, people from Haifa and Jerusalem inside Anatolia again. Again, here was the political considerations played an important role for them. So this is the third reason. And the fourth, deportation and resettlement of Muslims as a result of the exigencies of war. So the Kurds, for example, had escaped Eastern war zones. They escaped the Russian army. This unexpected escape became an important part of Ottoman demographic policy. And the number of Muslims who had be resettled, it, who had to be resettled in the new areas was approximately one million. So this is the interesting comparison for us between Armenian relocation and the Muslim relocation. In Armenian, in Muslim case, uh, 
they really successfully resettled Muslims in different part of Anatolia, and there were no much death and uh, killings and so on, but in Armenians, almost 80% of the population perished. This shows also the genocidal intent of the policy. Point three, a part of this demographic policy towards the end of 1913, Ottoman government created a new regulation in May 1913 and established a special department on immigration and resettlement within the interior ministry. So one important aspect of this May regulation was to renaming of Christian villages as part of Turkification policy. After the expulsion of Armenians and Assyrians in 1915, they accelerated the renaming process these measures were carried out mostly by provincial administrative commissions and were not well organized. In order to stabilize this process, the defense ministry issued an instruction, January 15, 1916. These instructions restated the order to change all names of towns, villages, mountains, rivers that had non-Islamic names into Turkish names. The telegram also emphasized that this renaming process should be completed as soon as possible. This process, however, created an enormous problem during the war years as no one was familiar with these new names. As a second degree, they canceled this process because the military officers, generals could not communicate with each other with these new names. They stopped this process. And I am from this area, Kars. I was born there. And I remember 1970s, they were still trying to change the Armenian, Greek, and Georgian names, the Christian names of the villages surrounding my village and my town. This is still an ongoing process in Turkey. Wherever they discover some Christian name, they really are after it, and they change it. This is what we call maybe a part of a cultural genocide. You should really eradicate everything Christian from that picture. This is the overall idea, actually. Point four, implementing this general new population resettlement plan, Ottoman authorities created maps of every region showing the ethnic demographic of each area. They not only created an ethnic map for every region, but also a social one, detailing the education, language, and economic conditions of the different ethnic groups and the relationship between them. For example, here a quote from a telegram to different provinces from 1915. Quote, there is a need for the procurement of two locks in which the national identities of the population for each administrative unit from counties to villages is shown. They should prepare this map and send to central government. Again, from another coded telegram. It says, uh, the national identities of population must be written down from both past and present, all changes, and even the village level, these changes and the numbers should be sent to Istanbul. There are dozens of similar documents requesting different information in every region. Just one more example for you. 1916, the Interior Ministry was requesting the procurement and dispatch of a log of the names of villages set free, for example, in the Marmara region, vacated, set free in Marmara Coast, along with the numbers of the Greek deportees from that region and the localities. And we can infirm from these documents also dated one thing also very interesting. It was the priests and the rabbis and other officials, Ottoman officials, but basically the religious leaders of the Christian communities. They were put on charge to send this information. When they sent wrong information or they denied information, they were punished. 
This is based on Ottoman documents that we know. Point five, the resettlement of Muslims began immediately after the expulsion of the Christian for the purpose of repopulating the villages vacated by Christians. We can infer from Ottoman documents really the time span, the time difference between emptying the Armenian villages and relocating, resettling the Muslims in that villages in some areas, it's not more than two weeks. It shows also how well they were prepared. Why I'm telling all this, I want to make one point clear. It is not a simple Islamic fanatism. There, it's very clear that religion played an important role and on the basis of religious identities, they implement certain plans, but this plan has some social engineering aspects also. This is this important two aspect we have to keep in mind. So uh, the differences between emptying the villages and uh, settling the Muslim immigrants really very, was very short, and it shows us really the pre-planned uh, demographic policy of Ottoman Empire. Point six, the main goal of the resettlement policy against <laughs> the different Muslim ethnic group was their forced assimilation. In Ottoman documents, the term temsil or temessül, which are singular and plural terms in Arabic for assimilation are openly used. So they used really the term assimilation openly. And in order to achieve this assimilation, Muslim groups were separated from their religious leaders. For example, Kurdish tribal leaders had to be separated from the Kurdish tribe and settled in different areas. Not only were the leaders placed away from their group, but the group itself was dispersed throughout Anatolia. For example, in a telegram, again, dated May 2nd, 1916, it is clearly stated that the intention of the resettlement policy of the Kurds was to make the Kurds forget their ethnic and cultural identity. Thus, they should not be resettled in areas that would allow them to retain their national identity. For example, local authorities wanted, it's not on the map, there is a town here very close now on the fight going on, Urfa, and there are Arabs living in that town also, and local authorities relocated certain Kurds around the Urfa province. And central authorities said that, no, no, Kurds had a very good relation with Arabs, and they would never forget their, uh, their uh, culture and their language. They should be sent inside Anatolia, basically, around Konya. So the purpose was that Kurds or other non-Turkish Muslim group should forget their culture and languages, assimilation. Point seven, the documents explicitly show that the government ordered the regional authorities to ensure that any relocated group not exceed five or 10% of the original population. Even it was a fact for the Armenians. Some scholar, such as myself, learned this five or 10% policy from a document relating to Armenians published by Turkish government around early 1980s. It was one single document. Uh, it was a letter a decree sent or a letter written by defense ministry to interior ministry. And it was published in one of the official Turkish uh, state books. And we consider, we dismiss this document saying that, you know, it's a cover up attempt, a smoke screen. Now, we, new documents from the Ottoman archive indicates that this was not in fact a cover up, but rather a calculated policy applied not only to Armenians, but also Greeks, Arabs, Kurds, Albanians, Bosnians, and others. 
It is clearly stated in the documents. These are the documents that I'm talking about, secret documents, <coughs> ciphered secret documents sent from central government to regions. This was not for public consumptions. And in these documents, they openly mention these five, 10 percent regulation. And in some cases even, for example, uh, there is a city here, Galipoviklar, the land is the Çanakkale in Turkish, we call it. They sent a telegram 1916 uh, from interior ministry saying that the Greeks, they already sent some, most of them in 1913-14, the remain, remaining Greeks and the Armenians, they said it's not exceeding 5%. There is no need to deport Christian from that city. So they really made a calculation in that sense. Uh, and in each region, the government, the local authorities, kept continual track of population percentage. Central government constantly asking the numbers, both of expelled groups and remaining and relocated groups. And continuously, they were asking their relation to each other. And not, for example, in case of Armenians, they were not only asking generally as Armenians, they were asking the percentages of Gregorian Armenians, the Orthodox Armenians, the Protestant Armenians, and the Catholics, Armenians, their percentage to each other and their percentage to the Muslim population. And I publish extensively in my book, almost weekly basis, they were keeping this record. And one more shocking information for you. Who was in charge of Armenian deportation throughout this period? It was in the interior ministry, an office which they called Office of Statistics. Office of Statistics was in charge of the entire deportation process. And they were keeping continuously numbers of the Armenians. So there is a question to ask here. According to Ottoman statistic, the number of deported Armenians was around 1.2 million. And the Muslim population in Syria and Iraq, where the Armenians were supposed to be settled, was around 2 million. So the short story of Armenian genocide is Armenians from throughout Anatolia were officially deported beginning of 1914 May all the way 1915 November, December into desert area, today's Syria, Derzor, and basically Aleppo and the surrounding area. They established, for example, concentration camps around this river here. And the number of Armenians that they theoretically repopulate was 1.2 million. This is fact. This is the Ottoman documents. This is the conservative number. 1.2 million Armenian officially, according to Ottoman documents, relocated or have to be have to be relocated in that area. And in the telegrams that they were sending, not only to the Aleppo, Mosul, or to other governors saying that Armenians should not exceed 10% of local Muslim population. Make a map. The, I mean, very generous population calculus. The entire area, even Mosul, was not a, actually a resettlement area changed over the months. The entire area, if we include the Muslim also, the population of Muslim population were around 2 million. So if you want to settle Armenians as 10% of the Muslim population, what would you do with 1.2 million Armenians? And guess what? How many Armenians survived at the end? The genocidal process. You cannot believe it is around 150 to 200,000. My sense is Ottoman Union and Progress Party were more successful than the Nazis. Compare the plans and implementation of the plan. 
I mean, a lot of Holocaust scholars emphasizes this policy, this, this issue. There is a big discrepancy between the planning of Holocaust because they were planning a, to create a racial empire in the entire Eastern Europe and the realization of this plan I mean, according to Götz Ali, for example, it is only maybe 20, 30 percent of the entire Nazi plan could be implemented. In Ottoman case, I would say they really successfully implemented their genocidal policy. And one more information for you. Because they were taking almost weekly basis censuses, the population numbers, and 1915, towards the end of 1915, they got the information that the number of Armenians in that area were around 500,000. And this was the reason 1916 summer months, they organized a second big massacre, mass killing 1916 summer months, especially in the Derzor area. This is today a monument, and it was attacked by ISIS, and they destroyed the Armenian genocide memorial there in that place. And we call that Zor Auschwitz of Armenian genocide. It is really the symbol. More than 200,000 Armenians were exterminated within two months in 1916 summer. So this is the population policy that really they kept the number of uh, the percent, ten, five, 10 percent population. Point eight, this is my last point. One of the purposes behind removing the Christian population from Anatolia was to develop a Turkish Muslim bourgeois class. So first, the religion differences, I put it. Second is the demographic policy, and now the economy, the economic aspect coming in the game, in the play. And this was really most ignored by s scholars also. And they wanted to create a Turkish Muslim bourgeois class. In furtherance of this purpose, the properties of Greeks, Assyrians, and Armenians were either sold at bargain basement prices or distributed for free to Muslims. Ottoman authorities issued different laws and regulations in this regard. In a nutshell, these laws and regulations mandated that a special commission be established in each provinces and that the Armenian and Greek properties be registered in a special ledger and that some of these properties by so be sold by auction. Crops and livestock were to be treated the same way. Fields were supposed to be harvested and the crops sold with the proceed from the sale to be recorded in these ledgers. And today, we don't know where these ledgers are. They are vanished. You cannot find these uh, ledgers in Ottoman archives. So what actually happened to the properties that were confiscated during the war years? Based on Ottoman documents, we can clearly show that the Ottoman authorities handled the confiscated movable and non-movable Christian properties in a very systematic way. There were four chief ways that these resources were processed. First, they were distributed among the Muslim immigrants in the regions to create a Muslim bourgeois class with enough capital that could presumably rival and replace that what had been lost with the expulsion of Christian bourgeois. Second, they were given to Muslim immigrants who resettled in the Greek and Armenian villages. Third, they were used to cover military expenses. So the war was financed by the revenues of the Christian properties. Third, or the, third they were used to cover military expenses. And fourth, some of the substantial buildings were repurposed for government uses, such as prisons, schools, hospital, or for other public services. Just one small example. If you travel throughout Anatolia, almost in all major cities, there is a good looking, beautiful building. They call it, for example, House of Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal's house. And mostly these houses belong either to a Greek or an Armenian. 
it's freely given to Mustafa Kemal when he visited the city. And not only to him, of course, the entire ruling elite was a part of this economic plunder. So this is the uh, some substantive fourth element. So I will conclude my talk here by returning to the main point. While there were some occasional disruption in the policies that were followed regarding the Christians between 1878 and 1924, the Ottomans nevertheless exhibited a very clear consistency. consistency. After the Balkan War, especially in 1912 in particular, without making much distinction between Greeks, Assyrian, or Armenians, the elimination of Christians from anywhere in Anatolia, throughout a process, not a one single act, throughout a process by different actions, they really eliminated and removed the Christian from Anatolia, and this was the bedrock of this policy. The Pontus genocide, 1921-22, and the population exchange of 1924 were the last chapters of this process of ethnic cleansing or Ottoman genocide against Christians. Republic of Turkey today, which was established in 1923, owes its existence to the extermination of Christians from Anatolia. Christians were approximately 20, 25% of entire Ottoman population, population in 1914. Today, Christians are not even 1% of Turkish population. And we, occasionally you hear, we are proud of being a Muslim country, 99.5 Muslims in Turkey. And the proud actually based on an extermination policy of Christians. So if the genocide of Pontus Greeks and Assyrian, not to mention the Armenian genocide, continues to be denied today, in the face of a mountain of contrary evidence, the most fundamental reason for this is that modern Turkey was constructed on top of this annihilation and denial, allows the Turkish government to perpetuate the myth of an exclusive <coughs> legacy over these lands. If Turkey cares, if you ask me, about its reputation and wants to be considered a respected member of Europe, and civilized countries in the world at large, it must first and foremost confront this dark chapter in its founding and make honesty and integrity a principle of governance. And you can also now understand why Turkey have so, has so much difficulty today in the policy in the Middle East towards Christians, towards Alevites, and towards, of course, other, towards Kurds. Because they mentally, ideologically, economically, based on a fact which really can be summarized as extermination, almost 25, 30% of their population. Thank you very much for listening. Question for the professor. Teşekkür ederim, professor. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what about the Jewish minority in those lands too, as well as the Christians. Uh, what happened to them? I constantly think of Hitler's remark 20 years later about "Wer denkt sich heute an die Armenianer?" Who remembers the Armenians now? And I always go back to that and, and try to make the connection and interpret that the way it should be, not mistakenly, not misunderstanding that. As I mentioned, again I repeat, there was a policy of deportation of Jews from Haifa and Jerusalem around 1916, this process went through different steps. Couple of sentences, the Jews who
who came basically from Russia, they kept their citizenship. And first step was for Ottomans to push Jews to accept Ottoman citizenry. If they declined to accept Ottoman citizenship, then they put some Jews on ship and forcibly sent away to Greece. It created a huge, really, problem in international arena, even during the war years, because Germans had very strong interest to win the Russian Jews and for their sites, and they needed, they were a very pro-Jewish, they developed a pro-Jewish policy. They pressured Ottomans also not to send the Jews outside of country. And 1916-17s, as the British army was advancing from here, there were, of course, Jewish volunteers on the side of British army, like in the Armenian case here, 1914. And as a precautious measure, they took some of the Jewish population. There were small attacks and massacres, but in a very small scale. I don't remember the number. And they moved the Jewish population in that area. Overall, there was no systematic policy against Jews because it was not a security threat for them. It was a small number only in that area, and they really implemented this small scale of deportation. Um, I, I'm a little confused about uh, th this is all religiously based. The extermination is of uh, non-Muslims. Non and the treatment of Muslims, even when moved around, is, is different. And yet, it's not uh, seemingly, in your account, a jihad. Um, so is the basis uh, Islamic supremacism, like we see in, the, in modern day now? Um, or is it, is it mixed with uh, Turkish nationalism? What elements are jihadic and what are nationalist? And, and just one side question, some of us here have worked with uh, the uh, result of uh, jihadic movements here, and that is slavery, uh, Boko Haram and South Sudan. Was there any uh, element of enslavement of the Christian Dimi uh, population? It's a very long topic for itself. <laughs> uh, I start with them last. They indeed implemented a conscious policy of assimilation basically towards Armenians. And it fluctuated throughout the genocidal process. Number one, jihad, even though they declared a jihad, it was basically a product of German pressure. And it didn't help much to Ottoman authorities. They were reluctant because of simple reason, fighting with Christians against other Christians, you cannot mobilize your own Muslim population. Jihad, as, as an ideological element, helped in certain small areas around where Assyrian left, lived. So fatwa, they call the Assyrians. And because this is another part of most of the killing in that area against Assyrians was not centrally planned and organized. This was basically a local hatred of Kurdish Muslim tribes against Assyrians, and religion played a role. So the role of religion, in order to understand it, it needs more research. But we have to make a distinction between two layers. Number one the policy of the rulers in Istanbul, and second, the, how it's implemented in, on the field. The CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress Party leaders, some of them were atheists. They were positivist. They studied in Paris, in medical school, in engineering. They uh, graduated from the best military schools from Istanbul, they didn't have any religious fever in that sense. And, but on the other side, they knew the mobilization of people in the area could only be possible if they used the religion. And they used the religion extensively. So 
maybe you all know, if they propagated throughout the villages saying that according to Quran, if you kill one Javur infidel, you go to uh, paradise. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so they used extensively on the field. But overall, if you look the policies, there was no Islamic fanatism to implement a policy to the end in the, on the fanatic ground. I give you one example. What would an Islamic fanatic do if, for example, Armenian people from certain areas begging to central government, saying that we are all ready, we will be Muslim. Please accept our uh, appeal to be Muslim. Central authorities allowed religious conversion only until Ju July 1st, 1915. Only one month. When they saw that the number of converted Armenian were exceeding their demographic plans, they stopped the conversion. And they said that sent these Armenians, even they turned, they became Muslim. We don't care. Send them away as Muslim even. Because they knew the number of Armenians that exceed a certain number, they could never lose their identity, their language. And they explicitly implement, I will come to slavery, which is really the term that Armenian survivors used about their own experiences. What today you experience with ISIS in Iraq against the Yazidis and the Assyrian Christians, they implemented the same policy. I am now in the process of transcribing and uh, publishing the Aleppo uh, Chairhouse Records, League of Nations, 1922 onwards. They collected Armenian children from Arab, Kurds, and Turkish households. And approximately for 2,000 of them, they kept records, books. They are available in Geneva in League of Nations archive. One page's story of each kid with their picture. And horrendous stories, exactly as you can take these stories, change the date, and make it 2014, as if ISIS are uh, making the, the Christian children slave or the woman and girl celibate. And it was a targeted Ottoman policy. They forcibly married Armenian girls with Muslims. So the religious conversion and slavery was in that, I mean, slavery in that sense was a policy of the authorities also. 